Good morning, Wena. Thank morning. you for joining me for this conversation, which is part of a series of conversations I'm having with Chinese arbitration practitioners within okay. our At Home Around the World series. Every time I, I visit China, you know, I'm always amazed by the pace and extent of, of change and development in China. Uh, and and I, sometimes I think about the impact this has had on people who have grown up in China, seeing this change and living it you know, firsthand. You know, I think someone of my generation would have been born just about when the Cultural Revolution was starting, would have had their early years during the Cultural Revolution, but just as they, they've come of age, were able to take advantage of the opening up of China uh, and the, the massive development that China must have had uh, through, the, through those times. Now, you're not quite of that generation. You're, you, you are more you. <laughs> but yes. you would have seen changes yourself. Uh, and I'm curious to ask you, you know, what was it like for you uh, growing up and taking advantage of all these changes in China? I, I was born in the 1980s. And so um, I, in a, in a, in a sort of third, third tier city in China, and then I did my studies, um, earlier year studies in the, in the relatively smaller city. And in um, early 2000s, I came to Shanghai, which is where I am now at the moment. Um, and to do my university uh, studies. And so for myself, I would say um, I've seen a lot of changes myself as well because, you know, I spent my earlier years as, um, you know, as a kid in the 30-year city, third, fourth-year city. And then I came to Shanghai around early 2000s. It was a time when China just joined WTO, actually. I, I could still recall around the time people were talking about, it was such a big news. And then in the next, uh, well, I did my studies uh, in Shanghai first. Um, and after I finished uh, the, my university studies, I um, went to the UK at the time. And so and at, the, at the time, uh, my, my firm, uh, Herbert Smith Freehills, well, Herbert Smith around the time, they were having a scholarship program and they sent me to the UK I did the GDL studies and LPC uh, in the UK. I did trainings uh, in the UK, qualified as a UK solicitor. And then I returned back to China around uh, 2011. Spent uh, the past 10, 15 years on international work, um, particularly on international arbitration. I see... Um, sort of Chinese parties over the period of time getting more and more involved um, in international businesses. And that is actually ref reflected in my own, own practice as well. Uh, you probably would have seen it, that there was great changes as well with the practice of international arbitration in China. In, in early 2000s, you don't see a lot of people talking about international arbitration. When I was back in China in around 2018, uh, sorry, uh, 2011, there was still not a lot of people talking about international arbitration. Uh, more and more people uh, starting to look into that area, practicing and a lot of um, events and discussions on those topics. And so, yes, um, very, very significant changes. You know, what cultural differences w would you say there were between what you saw uh, in terms of the practice of international arbitration out of London uh, and what you now see, uh, perhaps, well, we can start with what you saw when you first got back to China and then maybe, you know, what, what you now see in terms of the international arbitration, or the practice of international arbitration in China. Um, yeah, well, practicing international arbitration in China has its own features, I'd say, um, I, I would say there are main two things that I have um, felt in, in my practice. One is a reflection of our unique legal system. Um, 
we we have our um, arbitration law and under that arbitration law you have a distinction between purely domestic arbitration and international arbitration well actually we call it foreign related arbitration so you have different um, set of rules different sets of rules apply to domestic disputes and domestic arbitration and foreign related disputes and arbitration then a uh, second i would say it's related to the um business culture and Chinese parties' understanding of international arbitration cases. Um, you know, international arbitration still is a more sort of, uh, it, it's still more similar to a, a common law style. Um, so for a lot of these uh, procedures in, in international arbitration, for example, like document production, um, sort of giving factual witnesses given or a testimony, those are not concepts that are familiar to Chinese parties. And so, you know, when you practice um, international arbitration in China, you would see a lot of questions coming from your clients. Why do we have uh, document production? Why do I have to produce a document which might potentially damage my case? Uh, you you mentioned quite a few things. I, I want to come back over a few uh, sure. a few of the things you mentioned uh, because some of them are, are, are of uh, I think quite as you rightly point out quite unique to China. Yeah. Um, and actually, I think for someone who doesn't practice in China, quite difficult to understand. Um, and in particular, the, the the concept of you know an international arbitration in China, uh, it's not quite the same as what we understand to be international arbitration in, in other jurisdictions. And for example, in Singapore, an international arbitration uh, in Singapore, seated or that takes place in Singapore, is one where either one of the parties is not from Singapore, the subject matter doesn't involve Singapore. Uh, you know, so it, it, it's got quite defined concepts about what is an international arbitration. In China, I understand actually the term is not so much international arbitration, but foreign related disputes. That's uh, and, right, yeah. Uh, and the term foreign related or, or a dispute with foreign related elements, to be more precise, uh, is not quite defined. Uh, and there, it leaves some confusion as to whether a dispute is foreign related or not. Can you talk a bit more about what is a foreign related dispute? Yes, sure. Um, it, there are some definitions, although these definitions are, can be fluid and um, Chinese courts are trying to expand such definitions. So um, for a dispute to be a foreign related dispute or a dispute with foreign related elements, you would have um, either one party um, or to the disputes is a foreign party or the subject matter of the dispute, which is quite similar to what you've just described um, in, under Singapore law. Uh, it could be the subject matter uh, is a foreign related subject matter, for example, a project outside China. Um, or the, well, I'm, I'm quoting, I think I'm quoting the creation, the modification uh, or termination of that legal relations to the parties to the disputes happen outside China. So I guess some people had interpreted it to mean that if you sign the contract at a place outside China, then that could mean that this is a related, foreign related um, uh, disputes as well. Um, and then there is a, except for the ones that I've described, uh, there is a catch-all provision as well, which says. Um, any other circumstances which may be seen as foreign related. And so um, I think traditionally Chinese courts haven't been using that catch-all provision um, a lot. Actually, they haven't been, um, that, that provision had, had never been applied in practice until uh, a recent case, a recent Shanghai court case called um, Siemens and Golden Landmark. I don't know if you've heard. So in that case, the court tried to expand um, the traditional scope of foreign related disputes to um, cover a situation where the parties 
were companies registered in free trade zone. Um, it's an it's an it's, not, it's an sales of goods um, dispute. You know, they're, they're sort of the the way that the goods were transported in, in the in the court's view um, reflected um, some features of international trades because it involved free trade zone. And so, in that case, the court decided that this is a foreign related disputes as well even if none of none of the parties were foreign parties, the subject matter was still within China. I think the other difficulty, the confusion around the, the concept of a, a foreign-related dispute uh, is, is the question as to what uh, arbitration institution mm. uh, it can be submitted to. And my understanding is mm. if it is a purely domestic dispute, then clearly... Uh, it can only be submitted to one of the recognized or registered arbitration commissions in China. Yes. Uh, there, is, there is a lot of doubt and confusion as to if the dispute is a foreign-related dispute, whether you can have an arbitration in China which is administered by a foreign arbitration institution, so one that is not registered in China, I think a lot of the discussion about whether a dispute is foreign related uh, also involves this question as to whether you can have an arbitration administered by a foreign institution. So I think that case you mentioned, the golden mm. is it the golden, golden landmark? landmark yeah. That also involved a question as to whether it could have been subject to a foreign arbitration institution, yeah. if I recall correctly. Okay. Yeah. Explain, oh, like, yeah. This, I, this to us, it, it's that's that's the one thing that that gets very confusing uh, from someone looking at uh, outside of China in, into the arbit international arbitration within China. Yeah, yeah. That that is uh, what I was saying. Uh, uh, special features of China-related arbitrations because you will have to apply these rules even before uh, a dispute is submitted to an, an arbitration, say, outside China or administered by a foreign arbitration institution. So I'd say, first of all, you, you have to decide whether the dispute is a foreign-related dispute or a, a domestic dispute. If this is a domestic dispute, then as you said quite rightly, that this um, dispute had to be submitted to a local arbitration commission, for, to a Chinese arbitration commission, for arbitrations, well, in that case, the arbitrations would be seated within China. Um, and then if you have a foreign-related um, dispute, then you have more options. You could, well, of course, you can also uh, uh, submit the dispute to domestic arbitration commission, but you can then submit to arbitrations um, administered by foreign institution and uh, that arbitration can be seated um, outside China. So it could be Hong Kong or Singapore. So there are two issues there. So whether you can submit a dispute to a foreign um, arbitration institution would also depend upon what the nature of the dispute, right? Whether it's domestic or whether it's foreign related. Um, a separate issue is whether foreign arbitration institution can administer cases um, which are seated, seated in China. So that's a, that's a separate issue and an independent issue. Um, and I think there, there have been cases in the past, um, a, a quite well-known case called Long Glide, um, in which uh, the Supreme People's Court of China confirmed that, you know, um, a clause providing for, I think, I can't remember which institution exactly, but a foreign um, arbitration institution administering a case seated within China, that clause was valid in that case. Um, but the problem is, um, um, you know, it, th that is a SPC, a, a Supreme People's Court case in China, and you know, Che, we are not a case sort of a, a common law system and cases are not, are not binding. Um, there, are, there, there, there are sort of contradicting cases where, where 
you know have, have, have different implications as well but more more importantly um the ch the chinese law the chinese uh, arbitration law itself actually um had not envisaged um, a situation where a foreign arbitration institution could administer cases which are seated in China. And so the, the, the law itself is very old. It was, um, it was um, promulgated in 1996. And so, you know, it's, it's more than 30 years ago. At, at the point of time, they never anticipated, the drafters of the law never anticipated this as such a situation. So there are some um, provisions there which might create problems for, for parties, um, you know, having their disputes administered by foreign arbitration institution and having that case seated within China. For example, one of the example is um, the law says if you want to set aside an arbitral award, I think that's Article 58 of um, the arbitration law, it says you want to set aside an arbitral award, you would have to make your application to the court um, where the arbitration commission is located. So the word actually used in that clause is arbitration commission. So imagine you have a Singapore uh, SEAC case, for example, seated in Shanghai or Beijing, you have an arbitral award from the tribunal, um, then you have nowhere that, well, according to the law uh, applying uh, there, then you would have nowhere to seek, um, where you can make an application to seek set aside of arbitral award because, you know, the location of the arbitration institution would be Singapore. So, so that's the issue that we're still having under the current legal system where the court wants to expand and to sort of um, uh, revolutionize the, the practice in China, but the law itself doesn't actually support uh, that practice. That's very interesting you say that. And you, you mentioned the, the, the Chinese arbitration law as being very old. Well, maybe because of the way things progress and change in China, 30 years is, is a very That's long right, time. Yeah. Yes. But if you think about it, the English Arbitration Act is also 1996. And, and it still functions you know, relatively well. It is not the model law, but it still functions relatively well within the international arbitration framework. Uh, and the Singapore Act as well was, uh, was also enacted. The Singapore International Arbitration Act mm. As well as all enacted right. about that time as well, so mm. you know it's not so much perhaps the age of the law, but perhaps at, at, at that time China envisaged a different system of arbitration. And one of the things you you said really struck me, which is that it seems that at that time that law or the law that you still have doesn't apply the same concept of a seat or place of arbitration as many, many other jurisdictions too. And to fit mm -hmm. within the New York Convention, many arbitration laws, including the model law, would recognize that there is a particular place of arbitration. And the English Act uses the, the term seat, but in, in most other jurisdictions and the model law, they use the term the place of arbitration. But the concept of that being that that place is usually a juridical concept. It's a particular mm -hmm. jurisdiction. An arbitration seated in England then is subject to the jurisdiction of the English courts, where an arbitration seated in Singapore is subject to the Singapore courts. Uh, you know, even I think if yeah. you have uh, an arbitration, uh, a federal system, uh, say, let's take the US, for example, if you have a federal system, I mean, it would still be within, within the jurisdiction of, of a particular state court. You know, that would be the, you know, the, the jurisdiction, that would be the, the concept of what is is of the seat of the place that it's tied to a particular jurisdiction. I mean, China, I suppose if, if I'm not mistaken, you, you're not a federal system, even though you have provinces. Yes. I don't think you, you're not a federal system. You, as you mentioned, the law is written to, to, to tie a particular arbitration to a particular arbitration commission. And when, you need, as you said, to set aside or have any court supervision over that, 
then the law asks you to look to the location of that of that arbitration commission, uh, and that would normally be within a particular province. So you would then have to go to the to the court in that province where that arbitration commission is located, uh, and therefore, you know, when one tries to to take the concept of seat or place of arbitration as it is used internationally, and try and and transpose that to the Chinese situation, it, it, it leads to confusion until you realize actually that the concept of, of supervision of an arbitration within China is not tied to a particular national jurisdiction or a, or, or a state jurisdiction, but tied to the concept of where the arbitration commission is located, which is a different concept. Um, I agree with that. I agree with that. Because I think the seat of arbitration, some people in China, they still have a confusion as to what seat means in China, even nowadays. And so when the law was promulgated or drafted um, more than 30 years ago, um, you know, this is not a concept, I, I'd say probably not a concept which um, the, the drafters kept in mind when they, when they sort of drafted the law. Because, you know, in China, there are hundreds of arbitration commissions and usually in each major city, you have an arbitration commission. And when you have um, arbitral awards from cases administered by those arbitration commissions, you would have to decide which Chinese court will have the supervisory power, as we say, you know, to, um, to sort of um, set aside, either set aside a case or be responsible for enforcement of that case. And so um, the reason why the location of arbitration commission term used in the arbitration clause is because that the drafters at the point of time want to give the court where the arbitration commission is located such power to scrutinize the awards um, rendered in cases administered by the relevant arbitration commission. Um, and so it's, 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 a, it's a slightly different concept because, you know, they were having in mind these um, mostly domestic cases, domestic arbitration cases, how, uh, the jurisdiction of the courts would be divided to scrutinize arbitration cases. Um, they were really not having in mind a case where, you know, you might have a foreign arbitration institution um, having um, administering cases, which is just seated in, in, in China, you know, is sometimes you don't have to mention the specific city, right? You can just say that the seat is within China. And so, you know, supervisory courts is Chinese courts and you don't have to specifically refer that the seat is in Shanghai or Beijing or anywhere within China. So it, it, it is not a situation that the drafters of the law at the point of time envisaged, um, you know, in, in their mind and hence the differences. In the provisions. This difference also gives rise to um, confusion when the Chinese courts look at international arbitrations located or seated outside of China. I, I read a, an article by a Supreme People's Court's judge talking about this concept of seat. And I think he, he also made the comment that uh, when when a Chinese court looks at the question of um, uh, the governing law of the arbitration agreement, if it is not specified, mm -hmm. they will look to see, um, first of all, you know, look to the location of the arbitration institution uh, as, as they will try to determine the seat. And in determining the seat, they will yes. look to the location of the arbitration institution. But out, outside of China, you know, it is very common to have an arbitration administered by a particular arbitration institution, which takes place in a different location entirely. I mean, you can have SI yeah. arbitration seated in India, seated in Indonesia, uh, and that, you know, for the purposes of the New York Convention, is an Indonesian award and an Indian award, yes. not a Singapore award. The other case, uh, which would be 
uh, quite common with the ICC. The ICC cases are heard all over the world, not just where the ICC exactly, yeah. uh, has, uh, has, its, has its case administration officers. So I think when you look at how this issue is discussed, it, it does seem to give rise to confusion because, you know, how, how, would, a, how would a Chinese court um, deal with, with a situation where you have, say, an SIC arbitration um, that is administered by the SIC, but it is, it is actually clear that as far as the New York Convention is concerned, this is a, an Indian seated arbitration, the place of arbitration is India. Um, if the Chinese court has to, has to look at this award, say in terms of enforcement, or perhaps it has to look at this award, uh, if there's an issue, let's say there's an issue with the validity of this arbitration agreement, and then you have to t determine the law governing this arbitration agreement. Would, you, would the Chinese court look to see whether uh, that the SIC was located in Singapore and, and then say that because SIC is located in Singapore, the, the law governing the arbitration is Singapore law? Or would the Chinese court look to see that under the New York Convention, this award was, uh, was, was seated, was located in, in India? And mm. then... Indian award, and therefore, you would apply Indian law. I mean, how, how would a Chinese court deal with, with, with a situation like this? So, first of all, I'd say what the um, comments um, that you've heard from a Supreme People's uh, judge uh, is correct under the current RB, uh, sorry, uh, the current PRC uh, law because we do have, um, and that, that is the, probably because what we've just discussed. Um, that Chinese law using a different reference point, um, a location of arbitration commission as opposed to uh, the law of the, the, the seat. So we do have conflict of law provisions saying that when determining the validity of the arbitration clauses, um, the court is entitled to look at the law of the location of that arbitration institution. So, that, well, I, I do see the difficulties that you've mentioned, which I agree uh, with, um, that, you know, in practice, you would have a lot of difficulties to apply uh, that provision because, you know, ICC can't see the, where the location of ICC is, right? That even if you're, you're referring to their, uh, IC, the, the body of the ICC body itself, and uh, you, it would have several places. It had its headquarters in Paris, but it also have offices around uh, the globe in other in other cities. So it's quite difficult to decide the location of that particular arbitration institution. But there is such provision under Chinese law which would allow PRC court to look at the law of the location of arbitration institutions. So that comment um, is not incorrect under current. Uh, Chinese law. Um, but I guess the Chinese court would have um, certain discretion. It, would, it could look at several um, reference points, for example, the law of the location of arbitration institution. It could also look at the law, uh, sorry, the substantive governing law of the contract. And, and so, you know, um, to decide ultimately which law it wishes to apply to decide the question um, as to the validity of the arbitration uh, clauses. And there's a recent interpretation um, by Supreme People's Court, which says that the, the court should um, look at whichever law which gives rise the validity um, of the arbitra arbitration clause. So, now that sounds like the application of the validation principle. So perhaps uh, China is is, uh, is is perhaps even more advanced than some many other jurisdictions in that regard, because the validation principle is not accepted uh, in in other jurisdictions. It's not accepted so far in Singapore. Um, in fact, there was a there was a high court decision which expressly rejected the application of the validation principle. And as far as I know, it's it is not expressly accepted in in England either. Although there are 
a number of cases which have gone to the English court uh, on, on this question of the validity of an arbitration agreement. And uh, we'll have to see what the Indian, the English Supreme Court rules on that. The decisions on those are, are not out yet. But yeah, it's, it's, it's been a very you know, it, it interesting discussion in, in that respect. And I suppose the, the question then that follows from that would be, you know, is China going to, now that there's an appreciation which, which I, which I can sense myself when I, when I talk to Chinese arbitration practitioners, yourself and others, that there is a real appreciation of what it, 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 the international system of, of, of arbitration is, you know, built on the, the New York Convention uh, and in many jurisdictions applying the model law. Is there going to be a move? Is, is there a move in China to say that China needs to revise its arbitration law to bring it in line with, with uh, the model law, perhaps, or the New York, you know, more in line with the system founded on, on, on the New York Convention and the model law? Yeah, I believe that is the direction. You know, um, it's been, the, I know that task forces uh, working on the sort of um, revision of the um, arbitration law and hopefully, you know, Hopefully, we'll see it um, coming um, in in a year or, or a couple of years' time. Now that might be very exciting times for for arbitration, international arbitration. Definitely, in China. Then I think that would bring yes. uh, China uh, you know, more in, in line with with, with uh, the rest of the international arbitration uh, system. Mm-hmm. Look at what is happening in China now. I think China is is developing, as you say. Uh, to be much more international arbitration friendly, much more in line with, with the international arbitration uh, system internationally. I think my view at least is that a foreign party can expect an international arbitration award to be enforced in China if it was a purely commercial issue. Uh, that, that there would not be any uh, knee-jerk bias in favor of a Chinese party now uh, for international arbitration. And, and also we have discussed how the, the experience of a knowledge of international arbitration is not very sophisticated. So if you say that that is what the Chinese arbitration system is developing to, and if you, know, you, you revise this law, which, which wasn't quite designed for the current international arbitration system, uh, then I can see China being a, uh, at the cutting edge of, of international arbitration. Um, you know, you've, you've referred to enforcement of arbitral awards in China at this point. Um, still, if you look at the statistics of enforcement cases in China, um, we have very good record of enforcing uh, arbitral awards, um, out, foreign arbitral awards. And so there are very few instances where Chinese court has um, applied or enacted the foreign policy exception, uh, very few cases. And so we have a pretty good track record um, already on that, no matter whether we have a new arbitration law or under the existing arbitration law. Well, thank you very much, Rina. I think this has been a, a fascinating discussion. I, I, I certainly feel very positive uh, about international arbitration in China when I talk to you. And I talk to others who practice international arbitration in China as the full uh, and sophisticated understanding of, of how the international arbitration system works. Uh, and I know that, uh, as we've discussed, that confusion arises out of the, the Chinese arbitration law that you have, which is quite unique uh, in, in, its, in its structure. But you, you see that people are grappling with that and you see the people's court, the Supreme People's Court grappling with that to try and, uh, to try and work with, it, with, with that framework, but still try and bring China uh, in more aligned into the international arbitration system. And I think uh, it, at such time when China decides to revise that law, I would see uh, that being a very positive development and see even, even more so perhaps it might be a great push in impetus for China then to to really uh, rise up to uh, you know, what I would know, I would think of as a cutting edge of, of international arbitration. Yes, great. Uh, it's been a very good conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. And I, and I look forward to, to the time when we can meet again uh, in person. It's not quite yet, but, but hopefully <laughs> uh, that Certainly. will be possible uh, at, at, at some time. It's great speaking to you, Rina. 
Thank you.